Welcome to Studio Bonn at the Bundeskunsthalle. Bonn is a city of science, it is a city of international climate politics, and it is a United Nations city with the UN University's Institute for Environment and Human Security just next door, with which we are excited to co-present this event tonight, how worldwide disasters are interconnected. I'm Kolja Reichert, and please give a warm hand to my guests tonight, Grace and Diritu, Zita Sebeswari, and Pali Palavatanan. Energy is an infrastructure. The internet is an infrastructure, but human imagination is also an infrastructure and maybe the most important one in coming years. This is Studio Bonn, the Bundeskunsthalle's public think tank on care for global communal infrastructures. And tonight we launch a new series of conversations between artists, writers, musicians, scientists, activists, and public officials. It's called Global Nerve Systems. We will talk about which senses we need to sharpen and which new narratives and worldviews might be worthwhile exploring in order to face coming disasters. Because we all know the planet is doomed, but we don't act accordingly. But we have three guests tonight who bring ideas how to change that with the empathy of art, the precision of science, and the power of formal invention. We have a scientist who broke news worldwide last year by introducing a new way of mapping seemingly unrelated natural disasters to shared root causes. The Interconnected Disaster Risks Report. Its celebrated second version came out just a few weeks ago. It explains what elephant migration in South China has to do with floods in Lagos and wildfires in Greece. And one of its leading authors is with us tonight, our neighbor, deputy director of the Institute for Environment and Human Security at the United Nations University in Bonn, Sita Sebeswari. Sita, may I pose the question to you directly that will keep us busy over the next about like half or a year um, in global nerve systems? What is the most urgent thing that should change in the ways that we perceive ourselves and the world? For me, it is um, fixing our relationship with nature. Um, in science, we are talking about social ecological systems. Um, in plain language, that would mean reconcile our relation to nature, uh, see ourselves as part of nature and find solutions which uh, respect nature and which allow and, and better support the coexistence. Thanks. You might be wondering who made the mesmerizing animations we are sitting in. They are actually an offspring from Sita's report, which was designed by Pali Palavatanan, co-founder and creative director of the branding and digital agency Templo in London. Pali knows how to design worst news to look good. His agency Temple is committed to their ethos creativity for change. Among their clients are Amnesty International, Greenpeace, Migrant Help, and the UK Anti-Corruption Coalition. Pali, what do you think is the most urgent thing that should change in the ways that we perceive the world and ourselves? You know, I really believe that in the spirit of um, this report, I think it's really important that there's more interconnection Uh, in the world. So really a mixing of skill sets to address some of the biggest problems around the world, governmental policy, education, human rights violations around the world. And, you know, these are kind of some of the things that are fundamental to our work at Templo. And um, so I, I think and I really see the impact, you know, at macro and micro. And so that's something that I'd like to see um, more of. Thank you. To my right sits Grace Ndoritu, an artist and also a shaman. Her second book, Being Together, a Manual for Living, just came out with Motto Books in Berlin. Ten years ago, Grace decided to live outside of cities and moved around from monasteries in Thailand or Tibet to permaculture communities in New Zealand. One could say Grace really feels the planet's pulse and explores how societies with most various 
knowledge systems across the world relate to climate change. Grace brings together also scientists, politicians and vulnerable communities like migrants for shared meals and meditations, mostly in museums. Museums are dying, says Grace and Duritu, and need to be healed. And as we are not exactly a museum, but something similar, a state-run Kunsthalle, I'm excited to learn what our problems are and how Grace would solve them. Grace, what would you say is the most urgent thing that should change in the ways that we perceive the world and ourselves? Uh, I guess I would echo by two other speakers um, with this idea of interdependence, um, that us, we're just one species on the planet. And of course, there are many other species and we need to accept that. And I think by relating to things like deep time and maybe seeing our human uh, story, it's just a small uh, part of what's going on in the universe in terms of time. I think this will help us to get some more ideas and to see the bigger picture. Thank you. You have also worked with the UN before, which we will hear more about later. Um, and you frequently use the word climate trauma. Mm -hmm. Could you explain the term climate trauma and what it allows to do? I think um, climate trauma is a particular term that psychologists use. And it's it's used in the sense of thinking about this sense of being feeling de debilitated. So obviously there are different consequences in the global north and the global south uh, to do with climate but it's this feeling of feeling frozen and a kind of anxiousness and not being able to imagine solutions or not being able to move forward and so trauma um, becomes embedded into our everyday lives and yeah that's why I'm kind of interested in it for the last uh, few years. Mm -hmm. Which hints also at that it might not only be about like losing yes uh, using using less energy, um, eating less meat, but that there's also a crisis of perception, an epistemic yes. crisis maybe that would have to be tackled yeah. to be able to um, translate the knowledge we have into exactly. actual. Yeah, I would activities. definitely would say that, mm -hmm. and that probably relates to your work as a designer, Pali. You know, in how to transform this scientific information and to translate it, you know, into different forms. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and I think art is a tool for that as well. Sita, how is it in science? Do do you guys in environmentalism and climate science, in climate studies, do you do you use the term climate trauma? Does it relate to things that you? Um, perceive in your in your work? Are we living in climate trauma? <laughs> um, no, so I, I did not know this word before. Um, actually, I heard it first uh, in, in the course of this conversation. But um, and also, I think science does have um, um, a very good description of where we are at in terms of the climate change, but also what are possible solutions, what kind of steps we Uh, could and also have to take. I think probably what uh, causes uh, a trauma for um, climate science is rather that um, although we know uh, we don't see the action happening or at least uh, by far not at the extent which would be needed. And um, I increasingly observe um, uh, a lot of uh, frustration um, on the uh, climate scientist. Um, what can we do? Uh, what did we probably do wrong that uh, our messages are actually not um, are heard or at least not acted uh, upon? Mm -hmm. And um, I um, hear a lot of uh, frustration. And um, even if we are thinking about the IPCC, uh, which produces its assessment report uh, regularly, um, they are IPCC scientists who are Uh, questioning if um, uh, we need a seventh assessment. The sixth assessment was just published. So I'm a firm believer that, that we do need the, the seventh assessment. But uh, uh, the reason why these questions are um, asked is because um, we do have the knowledge, we do have um, science, and we would need, uh, so to say, probably a different ways to reach um, probably the heart or reach, uh, set, set more action into motion. Mm -hmm. And knowledge, science is absolutely needed and, and necessary, but probably we need even more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we need to align mm -hmm. with other 
So we have the knowledge, but it doesn't come across or it doesn't come across as something that is uh, palpable, tangible, um, adaptable. Pali, what role can design play in translating this data? into something that you yeah, understand. Because I was thinking about this. Mm -hmm. um, the fr again, I hadn't had heard about this phrase, but um, what I like about it is it stitches the two worlds together because on one hand, you've got the heavy data that, um, you know, talks about the subject matter, but then, you you know, it's almost like the head and heart um, idea because there's uh, empathy, there's an emotional level that, need, you know, anger or, f you know, being afraid of something that's come in as well. So it beautifully stitches those two concepts together. And I feel like the design process, we're stuck, we're, we're the bit stitching that, that bit in the middle, adding the, the sort of heart to the, to the head. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Let's have a look at how um, you designed a way out of this like frustration and 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 apathy, and um, how you two together and your team, Sita, designed uh, climate change as something that's actually palpable. What screws would we have to turn to mitigate the effects of climate change? Give us an introduction, please. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I think you already mentioned a uh, team and um, this is before I start with actually a, um, with a small deep dive, I would like to um, state that this is really a, a team effort, a large scientific team aligned with a communication team um, and um, with uh, a great uh, uh, agency working on the uh, design uh, did this together and, and uh, this is not imaginable um, as, a, uh, as a, it's a big task, so to say. Yeah. So to start with, no, sorry, uh, back. Uh, so what you see here, um, and many of uh, you are not scientists, so uh, you probably haven't seen this kind of uh, com way of communication, but you, what you see here are scientific papers. So this is the usual way we actually convey our um, results, our messages. So we would uh, write an abstract, we would write an introduction and material and methods. So how did we do the science, the results, and the uh, the discussion, and uh, this is all uh, reviewed and, uh, and a credible, uh, important piece of uh, scientific work. Um, obviously, uh, this is not in the position to, to reach uh, um, the audience. So since a uh, long time, scientists uh, try to reach out also in other ways uh, via policy briefs, uh, also um, working together with media or, or science communication. Um, but um, but uh, I said before, sir, so there is a feeling that uh, uh, what we need to communicate becomes increasingly complex. If you just think what happened uh, last year, how many different uh, disasters popped up everywhere around the world, and we try to understand um, the reasons, we try to understand how they are interlinked with each other and how that interlinkages can actually help us to better address them. But um, if we want to communicate this important message, the scientific papers, will be needed as, so to say, the, the hardcore science background, but will not be enough. And uh, this was kind of our departure, and this is where we arrived. Uh, you have seen here on the slides different uh, um, design elements uh, um, Templo came, came, uh, came up with, so to say. And I think uh, none of us scientists ever thought at the beginning of the process that we will have an outcome um, such as this. Um, but uh, let us take uh, um, one step back um, and um, kind of um, uh, take, take the first step. So what are we talking about? Um, this series is uh, put under, uh, also under the um, umbrella of, of, of climate change. And um, uh, it, it's, it's an existential threat. Um, the IPCC um, reports very well, that's an intergovernmental panel on climate change, uh, reports uh, all the impacts which uh, we are already seeing and also projects uh, the impacts which uh, are still to come. Uh, the science is uh, unavocable and, and very clear about it. What you see here uh, are the climate stripes um, uh, on the left-hand side for the globe, on the other side for Northern Westphalia, and um, the colors uh, show you, so to say, the direction uh, we are going in terms of temperature uh, increase. And just a 
two sentences on Northern Westphalia. So what you see is there's a more variability than on the global level, but you also see that uh, in Northern Westphalia, because we are on, on land, um, the temperature change is more than the global temperature change. That's because uh, oceans warm up less than uh, land. For all the international audience watching, um, North Westphalia is the, the German state where we are. Yeah. And where last year we saw these terrible floodings in the in the Ar Valley. Um, yeah, just to locate. Thank you. Where we are. Thank you. Um, so what we see and say that uh, climate change um, is a causing new type of risks um, at locations where those risks um, haven't uh, happened before, but also magnifies existing risk. And uh, that means that, for example, flooding, which used to occur, uh, might get stronger or more frequent, uh, uh, and the same for drought, for example. Uh, but climate change also intersects with other challenges, like with um, the challenges caused by habitat destruction. So our um, way um, to deal with nature, um, us distracting, um, disturbing nature. Uh, but also uh, many ways of unsustainable resource use, um, growing urbanization and um, uh, global inequities. Um, all this together leads to a new and increasing uh, uh, risk. And I would like to use uh, two cases from our report to showcase um, how habitat destruction and climate change interact with each other and how unsustainable um, resource use and climate change interact with each other. So two examples using um, our report. The first example um, is um, the case of um, wandering elephants. Maybe some of you remember uh, last year, there have been a lot of reports in the media about uh, 15 elephants, which uh, um, walked around 500 kilometers uh, in China, starting in Southern China and uh, walking uh, towards Komning, uh, which um, was uh, interesting because uh, that was the place where uh, the Convention on Biodiversity meant to uh, have the conference of the parties. Um, by these uh, pictures looks really cute. Uh, these animals were really in uh, despair. So it, uh, uh, it, the reason why they uh, left their habitat was very likely a severe and prolonged uh, drought event leading to um, food insecurity, uh, lack of water resources. Of course, we can't interview the elephants, but uh, those uh, uh, things coincide uh, with, uh, with the fact that uh, they were set in motion and, and left their habitat. Um, so why is that a problem? Um, because it's not just the drought, but uh, also the fact that uh, the original habitat got uh, Uh, distracted. It was encroached uh, by uh, human um, uh, land use change, uh, mainly um, for rubber tree plantations. And uh, so, so their habitat size and quality uh, degraded. And uh, that's coincided with the drought. And at the same time, uh, there have been uh, efforts uh, to conserve elephants. Um, because of that, their size actually increased. So you have more elephants, less habitat, and then the drought. And um, this um, likely was the reason um, that these elephants uh, left their habitat. They uh, caused around $1 million dollar, uh, damage um, during the uh, wandering. They uh, also uh, uh, threatened, so to say, a lot of uh, agricultural fields. Uh, they need a lot of food. So people tried to lure them with ananas, uh, pineapple, which they really love. And um, the Chinese uh, were successful actually to, to um, um, directing uh, the elephants back to uh, their original uh, place. Uh, but nevertheless, this shows how um, na uh, natural habitat destruction and our decisions uh, interact with uh, climate-induced uh, drought in this case and, uh, and cause, um, so to say, Uh, human-animal uh, conflicts. There's a lot of uh, and emerging science about these uh, human-animal conflicts which, uh, which arise uh, through these land use changes and climate change and the evidence is growing that we will see more of these um, in the future. 
So the report, report looks at um, the root causes, why these elephants actually left their habitat, uh, what are other drivers and what could be possible uh, solutions. Um, this figure is a complex one. You don't need to uh, deep dive into it, but what I would like to emphasize that uh, this uh, linkage between climate change, um, ecosystem change and ecosystem health and, and societal uh, action is something uh, truly recognized also by the IPCC. This is um, one of the main figures from the summary of policymakers, and this uh, shows, so to say, and the recognition of the interlinkage uh, between these uh, three. The IPCC being the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Thank so you. basically, uh, scientists uh, who uh, come together, spend their time voluntarily to um, bring together the available um, science uh, on climate change, state of climate change, <laughs> impacts which we are already seeing, projections for the future and also possible solutions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The second example, and now I will be a bit uh, um, quicker so that we can come to, to uh, Pali and the design process. Uh, the second example related to Lagos in uh, Nigeria. It's a, a city which is built around the lagoon, so at the coastline, and uh, it uh, um, uh, experiences, experiences flooding from different uh, sites. So flooding uh, may come from heavy rainfall, but also uh, from the seaside, uh, so to say, intrusion from saline water, which is um, driven by different factors, uh, by climate-induced uh, sea level rise, but even stronger is um, that the land is sinking. Um, the land is sinking because uh, Lagos is growing, that's compacting the soil, and at the same time also a lot of groundwater is extracted, which uh, uh, leads to even more uh, compaction. So, a relative sea level rise is very uh, high in um, Lagos, and most of it is at the moment driven by this anthropogenic impact uh, and uh, climate change driven sea level rise uh, will be uh, stronger and stronger over time, contributing to uh, coastal flooding. But what you see here on the uh, left hand side is also a man who is mining sand. Uh, sand is a precious resource. Uh, globally, uh, the resource which is, uh, which is used uh, second only after water. And uh, uh, here you see um, uh, that uh, sand is mined for construction of buildings, of um, roads, but we need sand in, in, in many other um, uh, activities, so to say. And, uh, uh, that's uh, a global uh, issue because uh, sand is getting scarce. The kind of scan sand which is actually um, uh, useful for buildings because you can't use um, uh, build, uh, sand from the desert for that type of uh, uh, construction. Um, what you have here done in Lagos, so to say, this combination of resource extraction like sand extraction and um, that's uh, um, with sand extraction, you, um, you are basically removing your natural flood protection barriers um, with extracting sand and sinking of land and sea level rise. Um, you are creating a situation where um, coastal flooding uh, will be uh, very serious in the future. Um, so for our report, we created um, a website where we bring together uh, 10 cases per year. And um, it's an explorable website where uh, you can um, explore uh, the disasters themselves, their root causes and uh, potential solutions. Um, there's also a PDF version uh, of the document, uh, but uh, kind of the full uh, experience is uh, um, if you actually go to the website and uh, you explore yourself. Um, we take every year t 10 different cases. Um, and this year um, we had um, not only Lagos and, uh, and the wandering elephants, but also um, the Tonga uh, volcanic uh, eruption, um, vanishing vaquita, so one of the um, uh, marine mammals which is at the brink of extinction, um, or for example, a, a heat wave uh, in, in Canada, uh, so altogether. 
And um, can I quickly ask, like, what is the base of this accumulation of knowledge? Like, how many people have worked on the report? How many different institutes around the world have contributed data? And from how many disciplines um, of science are are your colleagues? Um, well, so, so it's a, a, a new and new HDS institutional report. So uh, we worked uh, with uh, colleagues across the institute. Mm -hmm. and, Which uh, is spread all, all around the world, right? Or is it only in Bonn? It's in Bonn. It's yeah. in Bonn. But coming from all around the world. So we have um, uh, around 140 staff members coming from uh, around 40 different uh, countries. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and, the, and the, an interdisciplinary uh, uh, team uh, working together. And uh, so you, there's a core writing team, but then uh, there's uh, a, a lot of colleagues uh, in, uh, within the Institute, and many of them are here, uh, who contributed uh, with their uh, uh, knowledge uh, and uh, either with writing or uh, with ideas or with reviewing. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the special thing here was that we worked together with the communication team from day one, actually. So uh, already when um, we are brainstorming what kind of uh, disasters um, could be selected, um, which are emblematic for certain type of challenges we are seeing worldwide and what kind of um, uh, solutions and uh, root causes uh, could we showcase could be explained and could could make um, experienceable uh, for the leaders uh, from the very first day I mean, working together with the communication team to make sure that uh, um, what we are talking is actually understandable mm -hmm. and um, uh, digestible so to say uh, mm -hmm. because otherwise we wouldn't overcome that hurdle which we started uh, mm -hmm. to talk about at the and beginning. who had the idea then to bring templo in with pali and to let disasters worldwide look like this, like <laughs> really nice, attractive, um, <laughs> rendering something that looks like you could even like play with it, remodel it. Um, yeah, how, how did you get to work together? <laughs> um, so it was a, um, at the beginning, so to say, it was a procurement process, um, a, <laughs> a very bureaucratic procurement process where several, um, where there's a call and then uh, you uh, um, uh, have interviews with different agencies. But what we were searching for is an agency who was um, ready to, to uh, play with us <laughs> and I am intentionally saying playing because I think this is uh, the, the thing is that um, we express uh, our ideas in a scientific way. Um, I remember our, our comms colleagues trying to um, translate it into an understandable language and we were uh, searching uh, for an agency who uh, has got the fire uh, and with the fire I, I mean that uh, uh, already in the interview, starting to uh, to to play, <laughs> starting to ask questions, uh, which uh, um, which make us thinking uh, further, and um, um, it, it was really like searching for a sparing partner, and um, this is how we found Temple. Mm. And how did you like scroll through all the data you had? Like how how was the way from the information to the actual concept. Pali, how do you how do you deal with um, such a complex institution and uh, a bureaucratic institution also handling so much complex knowledge, putting it into a form that everybody might understand? Um, well, it's, I guess it, it wasn't, it, it didn't frighten us that when you approached us because a lot of our work is, um, <clears throat> going back to my previous answer, about um, mixing skill sets and so we're you know we're we're constantly working on subject matters that you know completely out of our comfort zone and we're trying to and I think that there's something quite nice in that beginner's mindset to to be able to not under, go from not understanding it to understanding it and then because we've gone through that journey then to bring everyone else along that mm. with us um, and we've got some other slides to go into the sort of weeds um, through that but um, See, it, it has the remote control. Yeah, Maybe you so. want to take over. <laughs> But, uh, let's see more. Um, This is not your work. <laughs> no. So, Zeta. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, th I think the science team were quite um, <laughs> chuffed with this um, 
um, right initially? Uh, yeah, so this was, um, as, uh, these are examples how we tried to translate our <laughs> uh, research uh, report, um, which, yeah, we had tables and we had writing, and we tried to translate it into something which we thought it's quite understandable. It's logical, <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. It's logical, it seems flawless. <laughs> <laughs> That was fine. Um, Something's missing but, though. Yeah, but I remember being in the initial meetings and uh, I was looking at uh, our co-founder, MD Anushka, and I was like, I just, I don't understand. I, you know, I was, but also that's part of my process where I'm trying not to, uh, to understand too much because I think, again, that beginner's mindset really feeds into my creative process. So, um, so for example, the one on the left, the, the, you know, I could see these event trees that made sense to me and they were built, made of um, topologies before the event and then the event occurs and then after. So that was fine. But it was the bit on the, the, the other side, <laughs> that second diagram where, um, you know, things got really murky, especially, you know, those, that's like two of two, a few events, but, you know, we're talking about 10 events that converge and You know, I couldn't for the for the life of me think about trying to understand where these trees, these event trees pinched and converged. And so that was the bit that um, we needed to to try and understand at Templo first. Um, so what what I did was um, I, I created what? this. So you want to go <laughs> back for this? No, no, I'm just happy about it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I would like to note here that the designer made them tables. Yeah. So, so we <laughs> so uh, we created this because well, I got fed up basically and um, <laughs> and uh, it wasn't getting to us and so I wanted to create this um, table on Miro. So uh, it's a great excuse to use a laser. Um, but at the top, you've got the 10 events. This is obviously for last year, the first, um, the first report. Mm -hmm. And then um, on the down the side are the topologies, um, the main areas. So, for example, root causes, drivers, etc. But then in between them are the shared root causes and etc. So, um, so I forced the, um, we sent that back to the science team and I, uh, we really wanted this, the, the, the data filled in these buckets. Um, And then, so we 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 went through an exercise of dist distillation, uh, where we took that, and then we we um, not because I thought it wasn't relevant. Uh, so we stripped out the the shared root causes, the shared drivers, the shared impacts, and we stripped them out because I thought we could use design to bring that back and explain that in a quicker way. So we stripped that down. We color coded what events converged and pinched that certain points and so something started to get we started to get closer to um to understanding the data and then finally uh we got to this final uh, simple distillation and uh once we had done that we could understand that you know there's um you know there's eight shared root causes for example and so we could work out within that those shared root causes what events converged at what point and this became almost a um i don't want to hype this up too much but a rosetta stone for the design team because then once we once we did that we could then access the content more easily and understand it and um and that proved to us that actually it had to be most likely event led rather than topology led if that makes any sense no <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it makes sense, but I'm, I'm I'm not sure if it comes across. So you would like f go from Cita's order system to to another one, like um, to not <laughs> typology uh, me means like similarities in form between the different disasters, right? Yeah, but you I would you would strengthen the connection to the root causes exactly right exactly yeah, yeah you would yeah. sort them by you would like boil it down until you had something like a kind of board game right exactly with different elements that can be put into relation yeah. and yeah. you made then the the root causes the the driving element to sort the rest yeah exactly i, I at least understand yeah 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 sure mm. uh <laughs> <laughs> do you <laughs> Um, maybe, maybe and root causes one. might be things like overfishing, um, like um, weak um, legal frameworks, um, things yeah, like that. Yeah, exactly. yeah. Weak, weak governance or um, insufficient um, uh, risk reduction efforts, for example. Right. Okay. Yeah. Sorry about the No. So, yeah, like board That's game. So we, mm -hmm. we established the rules of the board mm -hmm. game, mm -hmm. if you like to follow that analogy. Um, and then... Um, And then um, 
we presented we presented the um so the design team went away for six weeks and we really this is the ultimate project where we sort of bashed our heads for six weeks and we were trying to work out what try type of communication worked the best and we presented ultimately four uh four design routes um to present and actually I'll I'll be honest with you in this room we were quite nervous you know um we had Anushka RMD again you know she was saying this is a UN <laughs> and you know <laughs> you know we ha you know uh, really we have to we have to um present something um serious to to them but yeah. i really was quite passionate about the fact that the the um the data was so complex in a good way that um it, it spurned us on to create logical visual solutions that we thought would you know like you know put boosters um if you like to um fly quicker to communicate quicker um so yeah the four the four routes were um um, as you see over here, and um, so we presented one. I call it the the interstellar route. Um, <laughs> had this uh, tesseract um, sort of feeling, so we sort of led with images that t um, sort of interacted with one another, uh, and we thought that could be an interesting way. So we led with image led, but sort of multifaceted. Uh, and then um, Zeta, you call this the toothpaste, the second route, the toothpaste route. Um, <laughs> Where this was more led by the topologies, the the, the four groups um, of topologies, um, but created the shape of um, some of the of events that took place. Uh, the third route, where we um, just wanted to mash all the, we created these three D um, diagrams, um, three icons, and then we we literally like a hadron collider merged those, um, crashed those um, events together. And then finally, on the the the, the far end, um, we wanted to try and get hybrid of the topologies and events, but I think it pushed it too far. So that's what um, um, we presented. And then obviously, route three was chosen, um, and that personally was our preference as well. We thought it got to the the bone uh, of the communication piece quicker than anything else. Mm -hmm. Um, so if I could just take this opportunity to uh, take go back to the Rosetta Stone, the distilled um, chart, and just give you three examples um, using Route 3. Um, so if we take um, overfishing here, um, so you can clearly see the two events that converge at these points. So taking the, the 3D icons and fusing them together um, helped explain that very quickly. Um, and then, you know, um, governance, for example, in root causes, we can see four events are converging at this point. And so we then converge, to, you know, we throw those four icons together. And then finally, it can con uh, contain the complexity as well, you know, the simple bits, but also the, the noisier, more complex bits. And so this is um, six events that converge. And then we can, again, easily show that impact. You added depth. Kind of, you you went from 2D to 3D, right? Yeah. Like well, there's a different it, things could pervade each other now in a exactly in a spatial way. Yeah. We in our in our mind's eye, we had this like feeling that this work needed to be, uh, you know, compatible with the likes of like Wired magazine or um, New York Times. It, that you know, and mm -hmm. the 3D element elevated that you know the seriousness of these um, events, and it needed to be precise, not. A, a sort of illustration, acute illustration. It needed to, and we thought we could be more precise by using the 3D angle. And also, just an observation, just within the sort of climate change space, that th the 3D um, um, element w wasn't really used in, 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 and so that became something that we wanted to mm. sort of again inject with steroids and go to town with it and actually some of that stuff uh, becomes more useful when we've got like explainer videos and things like that where we mm -hmm. can go into literally creating Lagos and showing how um, you know the the, the land mass mm -hmm. go, you know the flood comes in the sand goes down um, so we can physically show that in a more complex way and so um, it became a useful tool. Mm -hmm. Do you happen to have a slide with the colored um, icons as well? That's coming. <laughs> <laughs> I'm patient. Yeah, yeah sure, yeah. that's coming. Yeah, you just should find at some point a way to also lead over to to, to Grace's practice. But yeah, let's let's take the time. Hmm? Do you want to go? Okay. Um, so we take a little bit more time. It's. it's uh, I mean, I understand. It's a complex. <laughs> <laughs> it's a complex subject, and I found ways to navigate through it um, by, by by this design. But still, it's it takes a long time to. 
to digest the report. Yeah. Yes. So what you are seeing now are um, the fact sheets, or what we call fact sheets uh, in the report. These are a two-page uh, description of, uh, short description of each of the cases um, where um, so the pages have the similar structure. You have first the solutions that's on the top uh, uh, part of it. Uh, then you have this uh, very interesting um, sinking elephant. So what you he see there uh, are waves and um, the 3D icons uh, sinking uh, in, in water. And uh, this is an homage uh, on our first report where we explained um, our thinking model with an iceberg. So the disasters being only the tip of the iceberg. And if we want to understand them and if we want to reduce disaster risk, we actually have to look into under, underneath, under the water, and we need to understand what are the root causes. So uh, this elephant uh, uh, sinking there is uh, this uh, iceberg model uh, where you have at the bottom the root causes, then the drivers, and the, then the impacts, uh, the impacts being just um, um, the tip, so to say. And um, on the second page for each of the events, uh, you see a uh, um, selection uh, of interconnectivity, so uh, interconnectivity with other events which we uh, felt uh, really important to emphasize. So it's a selection, uh, it uh, cannot show all the different in the interconnectivities, but what we felt uh, being most important. And it's worth noting maybe um, that these icons were almost like atoms, like a base coat that we could then take and, and try and explain and express different things. So, for example, those main collision pieces, but the iceberg, as, as Zita mentioned, but then also um, we could start to express some other more complex um, things using color, as you <laughs> wanted to bring up. So, um, Zita. Yeah, here what you see is, uh, see is the, um, the 3D model of the Vakita. Vakita is a marine mammal at the brink of the extinction, so we got only 10 vaquitas left. On the uh, coast of California. Yes, uh, California, uh, right? Gulf of California mm -hmm. in Mexico. Mm -hmm. And um, there is um, a, a lot of efforts to try to save the vaquita, um, but uh, so far um, the number constantly uh, declining. And uh, what you see uh, highlighting the root causes why the vaquita is uh, vanishing and uh, we don't know if we can still save the vaquita, but there are many other species uh, out there um, which are also threatened or uh, even critically endangered. And uh, uh, we need to look into those uh, root causes, uh, those being, for example, uh, insufficient uh, uh, governance and uh, um, um, not um, uh, uh, paying attention to mm -hmm. um, the environmental cost of our decisions and actions. And, and global like, global demand pressure also is, is, is one. Yeah, in case right? of... Because the, the, the yeah. Akita dies because of another fish that is traded mm -hmm. like the cocaine of the seas in China. Yes, right. uh, exactly. And the same yeah. nets um, catch also the vaquita. Uh, mm. No one targets the vaquita actually, but uh, right. um, uh, by by accident, so to say, it has the same size as the totoaba fish, <laughs> and the swim bladder of totoaba is um, uh, the one which is called cocaine of the sea, mm. and uh, uh, you you can sell um, uh, the swim bladder of uh, totoaba uh, one kilogram for more than sixty thousand dollar. So that's a, mm. a very strong driver, of mm. course. And what, like, I, I love this slide so much because it's so colorful. It, like, takes the <laughs> emotional attachment away in a way, right? It's like not, I'm not seeing a photo of a catastrophe of suffering people or animals, but it's like something that I could, like, remodel, as I said before, right? But what was the reaction of your team when you saw this playful and colorful depiction of your work? <laughs> <laughs> so the first time when we when we saw it, it was really like um, I heard voices like, "Wow, it looks like a Mexican fiesta, or it looks like a, a candy factory," and uh, exactly that was the question. So can we represent uh, something where people lost uh, their life livelihood, and uh, it's it's a very serious message we are convening, and then uh, we are using um, these colors. 
Um, and I think I have to hand over to <laughs> the Pali. <laughs> How did you justify your work in front of the US? A lot of anger coming from Zita's chair there. <laughs> no, well, you know, um, in transparency, we, this was a product of um, a co-creation session with the um, the scientists, the, the comms team at and um and because we were trying to avoid all the the sort of traditional linear um diagrams that we were that we kept ending up with um so we had this idea very um raw crude idea to 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 slice all the elements up and color code them so we went back with that back to london uh, with that concept and we applied that thinking to, and obviously we had the same conclusion. Wow, that's quite intense. Um, but, and we tried, you know, muting the colors down, et cetera, trying to b bring that down, but we chose speed of communication over the feeling, I suppose. Um, so very quickly, for example, you can see Madagascar and Haiti, they're connected somehow with the, the legacy of colonialism so very quickly. And so we, we ran with that. Um, to, as I said, these atoms had different functions and, and this was just one specific function yeah. and we could communicate that very quickly. Yeah. Um, this is another example where um, these color codes have been used. So what you see here is uh, the icon for the Haiti earthquake um, and um, around it, the lines represent um, solutions and um, um, something uh, which uh, this figure communicates that none of these cases um, have kind of silver bullet type of solutions. So you know, always need to um, make packages, uh, different uh, solutions to be combined with each other in a meaningful way so that they can address different kind of root causes, different kind of drivers and work together to reduce disaster risk. In this case, um, um, the the solutions um, we have for the solutions, so to say, short names, but um, of course, uh, behind these short names, uh, they are scientific technical reports which explain in which way let nature work uh, could help um, to reduce disaster risk in, um, um, in case of uh, um, earthquakes. Just to give you an example, because uh, in Haiti, one of the problems were that there's a lot of uh, deforestation and land degradation. And after the earthquake, uh, there was a lot of land, a lot of landslides happening, which additionally um, harmed uh, life and uh, life and livelihoods. Uh, so let nature work means here afforestation, regeneration of uh, of natural resources. Um, And these are all the solutions. They are in front of us. Yeah, so we, we um, just have to implement a bit, them. a bit different to approach, I guess, to mm -hmm. the um, root root causes, the shared root causes diagram, um, the the candy factory, as you mentioned. <laughs> um, so we, yeah, where they were made up of these components. What we wanted to do with the solutions is to give this idea of um, rings emanating out of the the icons to suggest, you know, the impact that we can. Um, so with it, um, and obviously came the color coding mm. as well with that. So you could like sloppily say you could touch um, different, with one button you could touch different exactly. instances at the same yeah. time. Yeah. yeah. What other solutions, what should be done to mitigate the effects of climate change? <laughs> it's in the report that you can download online. Maybe you can <laughs> I love this table. Yeah. Um, Koya, maybe you would be best suited to talk about this table because uh, you, you said that this was the point where it's yeah. made click. Uh, it's quite in the end of the report and um, it, yeah, it, it, it shows the solutions which is amazing, I think. Uh, let nature work is uh, a especially beautiful one. One also like the wording of it. Um, innovate, work together, secure livelihoods, consume sustainably, strengthen governance, plan for risks, boost early warning. These are the solutions for mitigating climate change. We have them. But what I like is that um, all the little... Um, items that we have got to know in this family of playing cards that we have played with reading the report, they appear again and you can see like what buttons you can touch with one move. And this, I think, like puts it all together. Amazing. 
Grace, do you like it? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Say yes. <laughs> I mean, say yes. <laughs> what we're meant to say right now. <laughs> no, no, I actually like this one, though, because mm. it's really cohesive and really easy to understand. And you can also see, you know, in terms of the disasters, I see that the secure livelihoods is good for Haiti, Ida, Madagascar and Tongo. So that's all global south, you know, um, apart from Ida maybe. But yeah, I just think it's interesting how you can read it quite easily on Mm. this chart. Mm. Maybe this is the chart to promote and make a poster. (laughs) (laughs) And I feel in the end what you do is also something like it's not like getting facts across, but it's also establishing a certain view of the world, a sort of planetary worldview. And um, I would like to connect it later with the one that Grace's work also establishes. You also use the word like you call your um, report interconnected disaster risks report and the this interconnected thinking is something that you develop by the means of like research, but also design. And you have used the term interconnectedness also um, a lot. Yeah. Uh, how did you uh, get to it? And what role does it play in your work? Well, I guess maybe we should talk about, uh, maybe we can ch- change the slides. Right. Mm-hmm. Could we have Grace's work on the big screen, please? Okay. So these are just different slides from different projects, um, which are interconnected. (laughs) Um, Yeah, maybe it's good to just talk a bit about my background. Mm -hmm. Uh, That might help, actually, and contextualize things. So um, my family's from rural Kenya. uh, So I grew up there and also in working class Birmingham. So a mixed background. And um, so from a young age, I was uh, experiencing a lot in wild nature in Kenya and had a, an animistic um, upbringing as well as, in, as well as in Birmingham, which was um, very um, a working class background. Mm-hmm. And so these ideas also because my mother, she was an activist and her and her friends, they had this group called Women in the Third World where they'd have film screenings and they'd do a lot of work around um, anti-apartheid. So taking us to marches and she went in retrained when I was 10 at the Truth and Reconciliation Centre. So issues to do with healing and, um, yes, um, connections, let's say, was always in my life since I was a young age, how to get on with different types of people. And this kind of feeling of humanitarianism um, Mm -hmm. was in my background. Um, So then when I went to art school, um, I studied textile art in England and then I studied um, in Amsterdam. I started making videos. I also had a double life because I had a big esoteric background. Um, working with different yoga gurus and different shamans and, um, yeah, doing different things. And so my issue was always like, how can, how can I balance this? You know, how, I always felt like art was something sort of kind of frivolous or something, because I didn't grow up going to museums. So I was always like, what is this art thing? You know, I like doing it. I seem to be good at it, but what's the point of it? You know, a question that most artists are busy with. No, no, I wouldn't say so. I think when I was at art school, a lot of artists were just happy to think about the material Mm. or materiality of art. Whereas I think having this background of growing up in a political household made you think always about how to change the world, how to make it better. Mm -hmm. So, and, and also with my spiritual interests and practice, it was always, I felt very divided until I went to see the Dalai Lama give a talk in India in Spiti. I went to some teachings and he talked about this thing called socially benefiting activities. And then I thought, oh, okay, maybe art for me can be a socially benefiting activity. And then it kind of changed the way I understood art. And I started to put more of my spiritual practice into my art. Mm. So in the first days, I would just put myself in trance and then I'd make these videos, um, stand in front of the camera and like perform to the camera. Mm-hmm. One of them is in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Yeah, the Nightingale. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but then uh, years later, uh, in 2012, um, 
when I quit everything and I went to live off grid um, uh, for, for many years, uh, living in different communities. Um, this is when I came up with this idea of this thing I call Healing the Museum. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and that's kind of where my interest in how to bring politics and art and spirituality, it really began. Um, yes. You, you write in your book, I see shamanism as a way to heal these dying art spaces by transforming them into ethical places that is team sharing and participation. What do you mean by sacredness of art spaces? And yeah. also mm -hmm. why museums like... Um, You could also choose maybe universities or unemployment agencies and try to heal them. <laughs> yes. I mean, I think sacredness in the sense of, for me, there's only four places in a city where there is a space for contemplation mm -hmm. and perhaps silence. And that's the church, that's the parks, the library and the museum. These are places that we need to keep sacred and safe um, because they allow us to switch off from the constant, you know, consumption and input of data. Mm -hmm. And there are also places where we can have discussions like this freely. You know, there's not many other civic places where we can, you know, have these types of conversations. Um, so, yeah, in, in terms of my feeling in 2012, I really felt museums were very disconnected with the reality of what was going on outside in the world, uh, politically, socially, museums, the programming, the shows didn't reflect the reality of... 2011, Arab Spring, yeah, um, like the distribution of cell phones. Um, even mm. climate Occupy. issues, everything mm. I was personally interested in wasn't in the museum. Mm. So I came up with this idea that I would like to bring different energies into the museum. So through working with shamanism and meditation and also working with the collections in different ways. Mm -hmm. Because for me, healing is a form of institutional critique. It's not just a fluffy, ha-ha, you know, kumbaya kind of thing. It's really about how we think about how we value ourselves, um, objects and each other and, um, yeah, how we are together. Mm. And so um, this book what we were talking about earlier, Being Together, A Manual for Living, this shows um, actually and describes all my experiments in the last seven to nine years of doing radical pedagogy with different groups of people, whether they're students, um, people at the UN, um, scientists, artists, um, migrants, refugees. Yeah. And yeah, for me, that's really a key uh, thing, you know, the how to be move, together. Mm, the powerful move you do in the book is actually having participants of your sessions and workshops um, giving the account. Yeah, so as well. So people of various disciplines, like telling about the impact it had on their work. For example, there was also um, a, a UN um, employee, a scientist who, who then decided to publish a paper. Yes, on yeah, I'll talk about that. Migration. Yeah, mm. later, mm. yeah. In the last Studio Bonn, we had Siddhartha Masala and Mathieu Kasyama from the Congolese Plantation Workers Art League here uh, visiting. I also visited them once in their art center that they built on a former Unilever plantation in Congo. Um, so I have quite an idea how like a sacred use of art spaces can look like, but how would it yeah. look like here, for example, in the Bundeskunsthalle, um, in a strictly rationally organized um, society? How would it look like if you would heal the Bundeskunsthalle? <laughs> This is the first time I've been here, so... <laughs> you have a But feel yes. for the energy of the space? Is, well, it's Does it funny. flow? Is it stuck? <laughs> well, it's funny because um, at the moment I'm the artist in residence at SMAC, which mm -hmm. is um, a European contemporary art museum in Belgium. Um, it's about probably the same size as here, um, but they also have a collection. And... The reason why they've asked me to be the artist in residency be is because of this healing museum project mm -hmm. I've been doing for 10 years. So I'm doing it in three different ways. One is a therapeutic aspect of mm -hmm. being with the staff. I have a staff badge. I can go to the museum when, time, when I want. And I actually um, follow and observe and also interview all the different levels of the museum. 
So from the cleaners, the security, the director, the collections, the production, um, all the members of staff, because there's about 50 of them. And I ask them the same questions about how they feel about the museum, what they think can be improved, um, what how they see healing, what needs healing, do museums need healing? And this is all in the context because SMAC are going to build a new museum by 2030. And so it's really important to ask, what's the point of museums mm -hmm. now? Do we actually need museums? Mm -hmm. And if we do have museums, yeah, what are we going to do? You know, are they going to stay the same in the encyclopedic model or how are they going to change? Mm. So this is my... Um, let's say, contribution um, to the development of the idea of a new type of museum. And for me, it's also an energetic exchange because, you know, for example, the, the, the head of the security team, he used to work at the U.S. Embassy. Mm -hmm. So obviously very different context, um, you know, um, in terms of threats. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but it's really interesting to talk to him about healing, like um, what he thinks healing in a museum would be. And he gave such very profound answers, you know, even though one would not expect him to have even thought in that way. Mm -hmm. And I think allowing the staff to have space um, in the process of making a new museum and to question and see all the contradictions as well, you know, because museums, it's not just about the, the people uh, who work in it, it's about the objects, it's about the building and the public, you know, so all have to interface. Mm. And so my, my residency is part of that and I'm working towards doing a mid-career survey show next spring. Um, but this is also part of that, if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. So this is like, you may, not, you may come to the exhibition and not see the output of it, yeah. but, you know, now I've been there um, at least six months. I know basically everyone in the museum. So when I go to the museum, mm. it's like, hey, hey, you know, and it really, it's great because normally artists just, you come in, you see the technician, you know, you see the curator and you do the show. Mm -hmm. You don't get to know everybody in mm -hmm. that aspect. And mm. I, for me, it's a really mm. beautiful opportunity. And like the ultimate form of, mm. you know, or... Uh, um, chance in mm. terms of healing the museum mm. and, and and especially because i should say you know as, as a european museum you know that was built in the 90s um its collection has always been very white male focused mm. and so you know that we have an open conversation about that what's missing in the collection what needs to be in the collection um mm. and that's that's good mm -hmm. Healing is an idea that is more and more prominent in, in an art discourse also. Mm -hmm. um, but don't you meet also a resistance by, I don't know, by, by the scientists in the program department, but also maybe in the law department, HR? Like, what do you mean by healing? Yeah, but that's what I mean. Healing can mean different things for different people. So mm. sometimes healing is just about being in, with nature, you know, or being silent. Sorry, or being in silence. It's not necessarily something esoteric, mm. uh, in in the you know mm. in the terms of you know language. Mm. And so yeah, I, you have to give space for people to mm. interpret healing in their own way. Not mm. you're not. I'm not trying to enforce what healing means um but yeah when i was uh, at art school healing was not cool and in fashion and i experienced a lot of um bullying around it you know when i would say i'm going to meditate or do yoga or whatever people would be like oh my god what are you do what are you doing but now you know especially for me you know in the last 10 years i've gone into art schools and i've spoke to young students about you know, meditation and yoga. And now it's quite normal. They all do it, you know, and it's weird if they don't do it. <laughs> so it's been it's such a big change and especially mm. since the pandemic mm. as well. That has really shifted things in, in the art context because mm. people had time to think mm -hmm. and reconsider what they were doing with their lives and realise maybe there's something more to mm. life. Mm. You know? And how can we yeah. imagine a workshop that you that you do? For example, you had one with... Um, people from the EU Parliament uh, yes. and also from the UN. Yes. Um, how does that look like? Like, 
Yeah, so the the project you're talking about mm -hmm. uh, is called A Meal for My Ancestors, and that actually took place in uh, 2017 um, in the context of the Syrian uh, crisis, refugee crisis. Mm -hmm. So um, for four months, I spent with two sets of people. So one set of people were refugees, migrants and activists, and another group uh, were staff members of NATO, the UN and the EU Parliament. Mm -hmm. And I gave them very different um, classes. So for four months, I taught pre-meditation to the refugees and migrants. Mm -hmm. And this was really about calming the mind, uh, because in that group, it's really about having um, a lack of physical stability, you know, and a mental anxiety, which mm -hmm. makes sense because of what you've that what they've been through. Uh, whereas with the staff members, they have a very comfortable life, but their problem is that they have such a lack of um, imagination or the ability to uh, think outside the box because they're always having to make bureaucratic decisions. So I gave them creative visualization workshops. Mm -hmm. And then after four months, I brought both groups together to do, here they are, to do a shamanic performance, as you can see mm -hmm. in this image. And what was great about that, you have all the different types of people lying on the ground together. So you have a student or you have someone from the terrorist office or you have a high court judge from Lille um, or, yeah, a f someone from the foreign office. And, you know, normally those people never meet unless there's a problem. So it was great for them to meet on a more positive occasion. And... Um, and yeah, and so during the shamanic journey that everybody went uh, on, um, where I do the trance drumming and then they go in a trance, um, most people saw things about climate change mm. and especially about um, climate refugees. Mm. And the woman from the foreign office who you were talking about before, um, she actually saw such a horrific thing um, in her shamanic uh, journey that she decided to write uh, a paper um, for the parliament and uh, start a think tank about trying to change the law mm -hmm. around climate refugees. Mm -hmm. Because currently, if you come to Europe as a refugee, um, if you come from a genocide or a war, then you can seek asylum, but you can't come because of climate reasons. Mm -hmm. And so she wanted to start this debate. And this came out of this non-rational methodology mm -hmm. using shamanism and meditation. And yeah, I was very happy that there was a very practical outcome that came out, with, out of something so... Um, esoteric and, and artistic and performative. Mm. Pali, I know that you used to have long walks in the morning and they are an integral part of your working process. Can you relate to... Oh, absolutely. Everything you were saying, um, this is the bit I don't put or tell clients up front. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it's just my personal um, processes, you know, um, whether it's... Um, you know, building 10,000 steps a day to get lost on the way to the studio and on the way back. Because um, all those kind of things where you're subconsciously not thinking about something, but something will come to you almost always. So um, I'm working more on my feet than I am at my desk. Um, the desk is just a doing bit, but also the shamanic experiences and all the kind of meditation that's fundamental to unlocking there was a lot of meditation that went through went into this project but mm -hmm. you you won't know that <laughs> would you have um, told sita that before or no never like, no this is the first time <laughs> they'll do your break you? <laughs> um, you know just but it's more a private session at home less um sort right. of impactful uh, mm -hmm. as that but um the, these kind of things um any way to loosen up the the pro my process and and because what i'm afraid of is knowing what I know. <laughs> That's one of the worst. Um, so I, whenever I always do interviews with designers, or for example, I was like, please tell me something because I don't want to know. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that's really fundamental to trying to search for new um, visual approaches or just approaches in general. Mm -hmm. um, um, so everything you said resonated mm -hmm. with me. Yeah, because for me, I mean, like I said, I've always seen shamanism as a political tool. 
Mm. You know, in my practice, it's not at all for entertainment. That's, a that's also what people maybe find a bit like fishy uh, around it. That it's like no, no, but you can't like put it in a box and say what it does. So like imagining people doing shamanism everywhere, it's, it's a bit no, threatening to some to some people. No, no, but mm. th that's because you're not understanding the science behind it. You mm -hmm. know that it's actually about balancing the two brain hemispheres mm -hmm. when you go in a trance, mm -hmm. and by act doing that, then you're accessing a lot also the right brain mm -hmm. which gives different answers mm -hmm. and that's why I do it in my projects mm -hmm. um, yeah so for example my relationship to science is in the context of that project a meal for my ancestors um, I, I set up a conference and I invited a medical doctor who could come and talk about the benefits of eating together And also I invited a shaman who's been working with the Sabon in Paris to come and show images of her brain being scanned and to show what happens when you're in a trance. Mm. And then I invited, oh, here's a picture of the public to bring food as well. So 90 people came and they brought food from all over the world. And then we had this debate with people from the parliament, EU parliament, about the European health system and whether shamanism can be a new tool, like mindfulness is. You know, now it's accepted that it's a, you know, you can go to your doctor and the doctor will say, you know, let's, um, you know, you should try to do some meditation, some mindfulness, mm -hmm. and whether shamanism can be the same. And so I gave, you know, medical and scientific um, data to, mm -hmm. to back this up, mm -hmm. and that's why we could have this uh, debate. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, Sita, does that sound, you're a very rational person, does this all sound bonkers to you? <laughs> Or, well, uh, I, I think there are different ways of knowing mm. and different ways of knowledge generation. And um, this is an area where um, science um, still try to find ways how to actually um, bring in other knowledge uh, system, for example, in the indigenous uh, uh, knowledge. Um, mm -hmm. um, the IPBAS, which is the intergovernmental panel um, on biodiversity and ecosystem services, uh, just published recently a, a, a report about uh, values, um, so different type of values and different ways of valuing and how this can be uh, brought together. And um, our uh, scientific valuation system is, is uh, one very powerful uh, tool, but not the only one mm. um, out there. And I think it is um, acknowledging and trying to bring in um, other knowledge systems uh, into into those reports is uh, something which uh, is and was um, and, and, and will be a, 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 a challenge. Mm. Uh, but uh, but um, some progress uh, is being made. Mm. In the last studio, one Julia Watson explained that indigenous societies, uh, indigenous societies usually plan in time spans of seven generations, which mm -hmm. completely changes the game. Um, in all the different societies you have encountered, Grace, uh, what were worldviews that you found most helpful to make the implementation of future-oriented economies imaginable? <laughs> That's a long question. Um, I can I can ex explain from my point of view as an mm -hmm. artist. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I wanted to just say something about value systems because I wrote this essay a while ago called A Ways of Seeing, a new museum story for planet Earth, where I talk about creating a new museum story and by changing our value system, because normally you we value objects monetarily first, then culturally, and then only spiritually. But actually a lot of objects, especially ethnographic objects that are in museums are not meant to be behind glass. You know, they're not meant to be studied. Some of them were not even meant to be seen in the light. Mm. For example, the Egyptian objects, you know, and for example, totem poles, they need to be outside to fulfill their own agency, you know, as that type of object. They need to be in the wind and they need to interact with different elements. And But that contradicts the whole Western model of, you know, preservation and curation. And um, and this is because the Western way of thinking um, fundamentally thinks of this as just this is it. You know, this is a material level and it's like a dead world 
mm. dead earth logic, mm -hmm. whereas most of the world, non-Western world, believes in something animistic, believes in something different um, and something bigger. And this is where it's a huge contradiction is mm. going on, you know, and um, causing a schism in the world because most of the world does actually believe in something bigger. But the the global north, which is the most powerful in terms of... Um, Uh, politics and e economics doesn't, you know, so having to shift that mindset and to understand that actually th the world is alive, you know, even if you can't prove everything with science, you know, mm. um, is, is, is going to be the game changer, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but to answer your question, um, I did a show recently in Nottingham, uh, Contemporary, um, which was called our Silver City uh, 2094. So it was a project that we started in 2019 before the pandemic. And it was, um, there was a curator, Prem Krishnamurti, and then the team at Nottingham, and then three artists, me, Celine Condrelli, and Femika Hargraven, who curated the show and also made work for the show. And At that time, we were really focusing on um, what we think the end, what we think the future will be, you know. And we ended up thinking about the end of this century, and we're already thinking about pandemics and all sorts of things. And I was obsessed with climate trauma. This is before the pandemic, <laughs> you know. And at that time, some of my colleagues were like, "Yeah, but by 2094, everyone will be used to trauma." Uh, and then we went through the pandemic. And then they understood, no, this is a real thing, climate trauma, and we'll still have climate trauma. Um, and so, yeah, these are some images from a performance I did, which relates to your seven generations mm -hmm. question. Um, this is a performance. I designed this room called the temple, which works as a, a display structure for objects, but also as a communal space. And um, I did this um, performance with pregnant women in the second and third trimester um, called Labour, Birth of a New Museum. And it's about connecting with the unborn art audience. So this is the audience that has, uh, is, is, is coming. It is the future. So the idea was to invite the mothers uh, to go on a shamanic journey to connect with their unborn children, mm -hmm. uh, to find the soul names of their children. Um, and so after the birth, they would bring the children back to the museum. And so these are children that will have a story and already have a stake in the preservation and wanting to see what happens to the art space, mm -hmm. you know, as time goes on. And so in my work, I'm always thinking about deep time or, you know, how to expand things mm -hmm. longer. And that was a really um, brilliant experience working with these pregnant women, mm -hmm. you know. Deep time is a beautiful term. It relates mm -hmm. to this like seven generation um, oriented planning, but it also mm. evokes in me like a, a sense of ground, of grounding kind exactly. of like, like there is a time like deep down that is also running and I can listen to it yes. when, I, <laughs> yes. when I stop focusing on the, on the daily. And most tasks. indigenous cultures are always mm. connected to deep time in the sense mm. of like their rituals mm -hmm. and their understanding and conception and earth. And mm -hmm. that, that's what is contradictory now because we have two t we have calendar time you know yep. 24 hours seven mm -hmm. days we have that going mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. you know which we're all trying to keep up with which is actually an artificial construction mm -hmm. and actually works against us physically mm -hmm. as, as humans in bodies you know our bodies don't like having to keep up this pace and da -da -da -da. Yep. you know our minds like it but our bodies don't Whereas deep time, you know, that's going on anyway, right. whether we're doing anything or not, whether we, you know, um, this is the thing about climate uh, crisis, whether we do something or not, time is still happening. You know, it's just whether we want to be able to live yeah. <laughs> or not, yeah. you know, as humans. Yeah. <laughs> But the time will continue with, yeah. with us or without us, yeah. you know. Um, Last question um, related to um, 
to, to your work, we, we we would like to run away with today with a few solutions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, do, do you have some tools that you would recommend to implement in our daily lives um, in capitalist societies? Well, I would say silence. I would say you need at least 15 minutes mm. to 30 minutes a day of silence. Everybody does. No screens, no noise. Even I know everyone has kids. Even go in the bathroom and shut the door. And you know, leave the kids alone. Off. I don't know, whatever you got to do. Because you need the silence to recalibrate yeah. your brain to be able to deal with the next thing and to come up with new ideas. Mm -hmm. Without silence, and this is what you learn when you live in a monastery, mm -hmm. you know, and actually you become really, mm -hmm. um, this kind of deep silence, it, 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 it's palpable, it's, it's a fabric. It, mm -hmm. it is what, you know, yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it, it's such a transformative thing you know and so I think everybody should carve out at least 15 minutes of silence every day and then just touch base with themselves and to remember that they are human you know and they're not just a mind running around fulfilling tasks that they're you know they are connected to the earth mm -hmm. So that's what I would say, mm. just silence. Silence is your advice. Um, <laughs> Sita, you have collected a, a number of solutions. Um, is, is there like some base core um, that you would recommend to, to implement in policies um, around the world? Is there some slight change of angle in, in how a uh, legal framework is designed or in how cities are organized? Or is this like not a question <laughs> that you should ask environmentalist? <laughs> <laughs> that was a big one. Mm. I, I think um, uh, if, if you ask this question in, in that big way, for me it would be important uh, that we um, act upon the urgency. Um, as Grace said, so times will go on with or without us, but um, probably we, we still want to make it happen that it goes on with with us, <laughs> so to say. And um, uh, from my perspective as a scientist, so the the possible steps are uh, laid out and, and uh, they are known and uh, they are applicable. They are not, uh, so to say, uh, completely out of, uh, mm -hmm. of reach. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we really need to accept this uh, urgency and uh, and... Um, I listened to one um, uh, presenter a few weeks ago uh, that um, um, he raised that we are actually living in cognitive dissonance that we we know from many of the um, things that we are doing that it's not good, like um, driving car every day, uh, eating a lot of meat and so on, but we are still uh, going on and, and, and doing it. And I think mm -hmm. uh, this is what we really work uh, need to work on to mm -hmm. to leave this um, cognitive uh, state of cognitive dissonance. As if we would all be uh, climate traumatized. Yeah, because that is part of climate trauma is that you 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 want to stop doing things, you know, these actions, but you can't, you know, you just it's like a compulsion to continue, mm -hmm. you know, and also dissociating mm -hmm. from the reality of what's happening. So some people then do more bad actions because they're like, oh, it's we're going to die anyway, let's go crazy, you know, and just consume more because they're dissociating, you know. So that's what's fascinating. I think, um, like, psychology and, um, yeah, the mind sciences, let's say, um, I think that's also needs, people need to think more about those as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. What I took away from the report as, like, one policy um, that seems valuable is, like, I found it interesting that you focus also on colonial heritage and make that really clear, like where <clears throat> in Tahiti or Nigeria, uh, you just see ramifications that still go on. And one of them being like you recommend that more agency should be put into communities, which also relates in a way to the concept of deep time, because um, it would put like action in the hands where an actual, actual connection um, exists between like the soil and um the people um, working on it, right, living on it. Mm -hmm. 
It's um, actually a, a great and, and increasing concern uh, globally that uh, in countries um, where we we have a fragile context, so um, given conflict or war or um, uh, a, a lot of um, uh, multiple disasters, um, so in those countries. Um, not so much is invested to increase resilience, to adapt to climate change. And um, um, with, with that, those countries um, actually uh, carry a double burden. So being fragile and um, a lack of investment into the future, mm -hmm. uh, coming together and, uh, and leading to a very hopeless and very vulnerable um, situation. So one... Um, uh, idea which is increasingly um, sought for is to to try to um, because in those contests oftentimes governments are um, failed or at least weak. Um, so one idea is to um, provide more support to um, grassroots organization, um, local organization uh, to to. Um, um, empower them and enable them to to bring in their own ideas and uh, um, I think we need more ways uh, to do it uh, in a good way and uh, in, a, in a way which is not patronizing and not uh, not taking away the agency again yeah you yeah I, I was saying also one practical solution something I did is that I tried to calculate my carbon emission food mileage for myself and to see what I would want to give up, you know, because, for example, that's the thing. In order to have more of a um, an equitable world, you're going to have to give up something, you know. Every, everybody's going to have, well, in the global north, if you live in the global north, you're going to have to give up something. So I think that's a thing that everybody could do for themselves mm. is to see what they're willing to sacrifice. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm. Pali, what you created with the data of the UNU um, is kind of a planetary perspective where um, disasters um, seem something that you could like touch and um, change their shape, kind of. Um, And you grace with the deep time concept, but also um, traveling so much um, and seeing so many different uh, so models of society. Uh, you also introduce a kind of like planetary concept, but kind of like from um, maybe from 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 below. Like, what's the connection to to time, um, to Earth, um, to humanity, and and Sita the the report kind of comes from above, from like the logics of bureaucracy and administration. Um, and I wonder, like exactly 50 years ago in, in 1972, the NASA released the first high resolution photo of Earth, the blue marble. And that forever changed the way that we see, in a way. Dietrich Dietrichsen made that point um, in a catalog that uh, we see different since then. So there was a whole change of perspective um, also possibly leading to like um, stupid songs like We Are The World. Um, I, I wonder if there's a similar change maybe um, happening today that's driven by big data, by, by the mass of data that can be assembled and put in relation. And if there's, um, yeah, if you see the possibility um, of a change of perspective on human action on Earth and its effects. I wouldn't, I would, me personally, I wouldn't mm -hmm. say that data's the change, I mean, mm -hmm. the change that's happened. I think, for example, that the pandemic and um, George Floyd have been the big, biggest changes, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of like in the recent decade, you know, yeah. recent years. And that's actually what's, you mm -hmm. know, because for me, I think it, technology, just putting everything in the te technological mm -hmm. basket as a solution, that's really dangerous. You know, technology cannot save us from everything um, and actually can create more problems, you know, right. if it's not balanced right. with, um, yeah, yeah, human change, you know what I mean? Perception is important. Yeah. Well, it's perception, um, the way that we humans relate to each other and each a different species. Mm -hmm. Those fun, those are fundamental changes. Mm -hmm. But for example, what you're talking about, um, 
places where that have insecurity anyway through conflict or even in in the west you know where you have lots of different social class issues coming up more and more and more uh, for example also with um all the issues with um black lives matter all the racial issues these are also energy uh, prices are, this is a these mm. are all examples of of fragment, mental fragmentation mm -hmm. That's happening in mm -hmm. the human consciousness. You know, these are they're just reflections mm -hmm. of that more and more because the world is becoming more and more complex. You know, and everyone really is becoming more and more specific. Mm -hmm. But actually, for me, the reason why I like shamanism um, um, is that it, it it was the world's first religion. It was on all continents, mm -hmm. and it actually shows that we have something in common. And so in my work, I'm much more interested in looking at what we have in common as people, mm. and um, which I think does relate to the UN in the sense of like, it when it was founded, it was about uniting mm. <laughs> everybody, you know. And I think that's, that's, that's what we should be looking at because now we're becoming more complex and more polarized mm. because we're becoming more complex. Whereas mm. actually we need to be looking at what we've got in common. Mm. Yeah. Or is it both the data and the <laughs> perception? What do you think? Well, I, I mean, for a scientist, uh, the data is always important. <laughs> and the question is, what are you doing with the data? Mm. And um, and in which way do you use it uh, to, to meaningfully inform um, or meaningfully uh, increase um, uh, knowledge? Um, so, like looking back at the IPCC reports and, and uh, their history. So uh, more data, better information helps us to make better projections and also to prove that mm -hmm. climate change is actually happening because uh, that uh, uh, was one of the tasks, so to say, in, in the last uh, uh, decades. Um, so uh, you, you need data, but um, just... Um, more data will not be a solution. So yeah. you need to act upon uh, mm -hmm. the new knowledge uh, you are generating. Mm. Pali, a, summarize, a few summarizing words um, from you. Um, you. You work for actors who are invested in social change. Um, what is the power of design that it can contribute to? It's, we're change? talking about this fragmentation that's yeah. happening and I, I feel it, you know, we're so mm. polarized. Mm. Um, And you're either, um, you know, ignoring the effects of climate change or you're gluing yourself to a bank. And, you know, I've always like been stuck in the middle of this because uh, I want to communicate the data in an open way so everyone can um, take ownership of the, you know, the content, the data and try and make, understand it from whatever position you're on, you know, like bad is bad. Um, and how do you, um, you know, so I've always like, whether it's climate change or the Sri Lankan human rights violations, you know, like trying to take that and push it into different spaces. So whether, you know, so um, trying to use design to delineate it from any sort of political Uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. like noise or v value, and and strip yeah. that out, yeah. and and push it into. And also, you could take. I, I like this sort of play where you're taking something and pushing it into different places, and not. You know, people don't know what it feels like. It feels different, and I think you can mm -hmm. break through the the sort of red tape um, in a way. Thank you so much. That was the first iteration of the new series, Global Nerve Systems. Learn more about the evolving program of Global Nerve Systems at studiobond.io, where you can also see all previous talks from the series Exchange Values and the series The Common Ground. The Common Ground will actually come to a climax this November with the Congress The Future of Critique, a joint venture between the Akademie der Künste in Berlin and the Bundeskunsthalle. During five days in two cities, around 90 international guests from the fields of theater, music, literature, film, architecture, visual arts, and the media will discuss the future of the public sphere. See you soon.